to tonight's event. We have guest speaker Mike White, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of Raymond James. And to tell you a little bit about Mike White, he has been working in marketing in the finance industry for over 20 years. And tonight he's going to be giving some insights on his experience, in addition to some internship and mentor program opportunities. And we'll also be observing a relevant case study. So let's give a warm welcome to Mike White to begin this presentation. Thank you, Megan. Um, I really, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I really appreciate the turnout. I know how uh, busy students are, um, and particularly this time of year. Um, I've got a, a kind of a presentation that I'm going to walk through covering sort of three parts, um, and we'll try to leave some time for questions. But if you have questions, um, don't hesitate to raise your hand. It actually, that's great to make it interactive as well. Um, let's see if this, all right, so I'm just going to manually do this. Um, hopefully most of you came here knowing who Raymond James is. Um, I always do this with students though, um, because at least in Tampa Bay, I know the first thing people think of, of course, is uh, the stadium. Um, and th this is our, our stadium in terms of our sponsorship, but we don't otherwise have anything to do with the Bucks. Um, it is a really important part of our marketing uh, branding building, so I'll come back to it. Um, sometimes if someone, if someone's not clear on who Raymond James is on, uh, if they know they're not, we're not the stadium, they may think of us uh, in the community. Um, one of our, our big uh, value statements and a big part of our mission is to, give, is to give back to the communities where we work and live. Um, and so if you're doing anything in the community, you'll often see Raymond James sponsoring a room or if you're at like the Heart Walk this weekend, uh, we were the, the company that raised the most money uh, in Tampa Bay, uh, which I was really proud of, was one of the biggest fundraisers uh, in the country as well. Um, uh, but as, as important as that is, um, of course, we're a uh, diversified financial services firm. And I've, I've been at Raymond James for uh, 23 years. It's really hard for me to get my head around the fact that we're a big company, um, but we are uh, approaching a Fortune 300 company, so we're certainly not a, a small company at this point. Uh, we're one of the largest employers in the Tampa Bay area, of course. Um, we have, a, technically we're diversified uh, financial services, um, but we're primarily, primarily a wealth management company. Um, and that is um, basically uh, financial advisors uh, providing advice to individuals. Um, so we have 8,000 of them in the US and in Canada and now in the UK. Um, we also have an investment banking business, an asset management business, and a uh, kind of a retail uh, banking business. Um, and in addition to being big, we've also been successful. Um, we just announced our uh, earnings uh, last quarter. Um, we're the only public company uh, that we are aware of, and certainly that's our size, um, but that has had, I think, I think we may be at 144 uh, consecutive quarters of profitability. Um, that's going back to uh, the 80s. Um, and the one time we were not profitable in 1987, if any of you are history students, um, there was a really a terrible crash in the market in 1987 called Black Monday. Um, we lost $200,000 that quarter, which is a really small amount for a, a financial company. Um, but otherwise, we've been profitable our entire history of our public company history. So um, that's you know, just at a really high level, Raymond James you know, providing services to individuals and companies. Um, and we've been doing, as you saw, for over 60 years. So kind of shifting to branding, um, uh, for most of us, including me, a 60-year-old company sounds old. Um, but in our space, if you know some of our competitors, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, most of them are over 100 years old. Um, and the reason you know, financial services companies um, have to have established uh, track records for people to trust their life savings or uh, their life's work to them. Um, and so we're, we're not a young company by any means, but we're relatively a young brand. Uh, and even more than that, um, before we put our name on the stadium, we actually did most of our business under different nameplates. Uh, so the Raymond James brand is actually you know, 20, uh, 25 years old or, or so. Um, and so I've actually been able, it, you know, it's, it dates me big time, but I've actually been able to see uh, the company not only grow financially, but also see our brand change during that time. Um, and what I'll, I'm going to do is just sort of take you through um, uh, kind of starting with that, that history a little, like the recent history is sort of a case study um, and talk about where we are real time today. As, as recently as to this morning, we've been talking about building some new ads. Um, as, as people who are interested in marketing, you know 
Uh, of course, you have to start with a target audience. Um, and probably, unlike most of the companies that, um, that you're really familiar with that are consumer products or retail companies, um, Raymond James is not a household name almost by design. Uh, our target audience is probably only uh, three, maybe maybe 4% of the US and Canadian population. Um, you can see the criteria here. Um, it starts with basically people who have wealth and complicated financial situations. Um, so we kind of start with half a million dollars investable assets. Um, that tends to be highly correlated with age. I mean, there are some young people who are wealthy or who have assets like that, but most, most of our advisors work with people who are in their 50s or even 60s um, who have more complicated financial situations as well as money to invest. Um, and most of them are seeking either to retire and or uh, sell their business. Um, we also have a kind of a psycho demographic uh, thing we put on top of it, um, which has been interesting for me to learn with our business. Um, people who have a lot of money um, don't, even if they might need advice, they don't always want advice. Um, the, uh, there's sort of a, a non-correlated kind of a, a, a something kind of inside of us that causes us to be self-directed. If, if any of you are do-it-yourselfers, like with home repair, it's kind of comparable to that. Some, some wealthy people just like to do their own finances. Um, so when we do our media planning, we actually try to eliminate people that are doing that, like you know, who are reading financial or kind of endemic publications or watching CNBC. Um, these people are largely watching or consuming media that none of you would care to watch, so you probably have never seen any of our ads. Uh, Sunday morning news programs, public television like uh, uh, Masterpiece Theater, uh, golf and tennis. Um, we do um, some kind of non-endemic kind of um, digital and, and print publications like uh, Food and Wine or uh, Architectural Digest, um, things that people who uh, have more money uh, and kind of disposable assets might, might kind of get into uh, consuming. And um, when I first started, uh, when we had just put our name on the stadium, we measure our brand awareness, which is basically a name recognition measurement. Have you ever heard of Raymond James? Um, we were at 19% uh, 20 years ago. Um, here we're, we're kind of middle of the pack for our main competitors. Um, and so I'm really, really pleased with how we've been able to grow our brand during that time. Um, but to be at kind of the more household names with some of those companies or those brands that are a lot older than ours, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and our approach to doing that is, of course, trying to be targeted and smart about it, but also having uh, kind of a compelling value proposition. Um, and uh, this is a, a cliche probably on, under kind of any circumstances, um, but we really believe this. This is how we describe uh, to our agencies, to our stakeholders, um, that we have kind of the best of both worlds when it comes to kind of financial service offerings. So on one hand, um, kind of the left-hand side, that, that part of the Venn diagram, uh, we have the sophistication and resources of a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley. Um, the technology, anything, you know, any kind of product that you'd want. On the other hand, uh, we have a culture and values of an independent firm or a boutique firm. Um, we do not push bank products. You know, there's a lot of firms that kind of have uh, things they're looking at cross-selling. At Raymond James, uh, we really do put the client first. And because of that kind of unique value proposition where we think we sit in the middle of that, um, we've been able to um, uh, thrive uh, during times when other firms are failing um, because we don't lose financial advisors or clients when other firms kind of are, are struggling. Um, and so uh, this is really important for us, not only from a, a business strategy standpoint, but also from a, uh, a messaging standpoint. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but we basically ask four questions to assess how well are we doing with that best of both worlds. Um, this is kind of the left-hand side. These are uh, basically the sophisticated products and services. Um, you can see um, how, if, if someone knows Raymond James, how well uh, do you perceive Raymond James to reflect these characteristics? Um, helping investors manage complex s s situations um, backed by sophisticated products and services. And you can see we're, uh, when we started doing this, we were at the very bottom of that uh, list. Uh, just a little sidebar, and I always feel guilty about pointing this out, but uh, Wells Fargo used to be uh, like what, who we would consider our biggest competitor in terms of that you know, kind of best of both worlds. Um, some of you may know they've really struggled with um, some of their business practices, and so their brand, which is a great brand and a very historic one, has really taken a hit. Um, but we've kind of crept our way up. We're, we've, we're kind of in the middle of the pack here. This is the place when we try to, I'm gonna show you some advertising. We really try to hit home sophistication and resources. Um, on the other side, with the Uh, 
There it is. Um, this is sort of more the cultural side, the small firm side or the, um, uh, the value side. Um, advisors are independent and free to act in best interest. They care deeply about clients. Um, and you can see, not, not by a large margin, but we, we are consistently at the top of that. So if someone knows Raymond James, we usually get credit for that, um, but we have work to do on this. Um, I know I've kind of been going quickly. Any questions before I, I'm going to jump into some of our advertising and how we try to bring that to life? Um, so um, the last 12 years, you know, we, when, I, when I started, we tried different taglines, different ways of positioning it. Uh, one of my favorite taglines, and also it was like a tongue twister, um, which means it wasn't a good tagline, was individual solutions from independent advisors. Um, it kind of, we tried to kind of capture some of the, the attributes I mentioned on the previous thing. Um, after I heard our CEO uh, kind of mangle that, like for the fourth time in a public setting, I'm like, we've got to get a better tagline. Um, the last 12 years, we've been operating under a, a, a tagline of life well planned, um, which is really short and elegant. Uh, it has the disadvantage of not really describing a lot about what we do. Um, but unlike Nike or McDonald's or some of the consumer you know, tags that you may know, um, we're never going to present this outside the context of an ad or marketing collateral. So there will always be a Raymond James logo and usually some copy or voiceover that's describing what we're doing. I've been in hundreds of focus groups, uh, done countless marketing research around different creative ideas. This is the thing that is tested the best of anything that I've ever touched in my career. It really resonates. Um, and it actually, in some ways, today feels more relevant than it did when we first came up with it. Um, the way we've uh, most recently been trying to bring that to life is under uh, this idea of a life well planned allows you to live your life. Um, and the idea, or the big idea, again, trying to get to that best of both worlds is um, showing uh, clients who have affluence and maybe uh, a degree of sophistication describing the, their career or their professions that reinforce that, um, but also reflecting their values. Uh, all of these ads have something about uh, you know, their commitment to their family or their community or some kind of passion that is you know, around giving back. Uh, and then, of course, because it's advertising, we want to catch your attention. So in a lot of cases, we're using their, their hobbies or their passions to do something visually that's disruptive. Um, and you know, having a, a beautiful photo, of the, these, uh, the ads I'm gonna show you were all shot in Spain, uh, outside of Barcelona. Uh, this was in a uh, olive, uh, olive garden uh, orchard. Um, and um, uh, that, that pig was, uh, um, was really like one of the, we've, we've worked with different animals and things. It was one of the most placid, kind of like laid back thing, animals we've ever had to work with. I'll actually show you, we had another animal where we actually had injuries, but in this case, um, this, this, uh, they named the pig kind of grotesquely porchetta, um, which some of you probably know what that means. Uh, but it just sat there the whole time, which was great. Um, they said that a lot of times pigs will actually get aggressive if you're not feeding them or, or uh, you know, letting them to kind of do their own thing. Um, and for the, the construct for this and all these ads is to say, here's three things about this client that convey wealth, sophistication, also those values. Um, and in this one, it was business owner, grandmother, truffle hunter. Um, a life well planned allows you to live your life. Uh, while you may not be transitioning your business and sharing your new passion with your granddaughter, your life is just as unique. Um, backed by sophisticated resources and a team of specialists in every field, a Raymond James can, advisor can help you plan for the dreams you have, the way you care for those you love, and how you choose to give back uh, so you can live your life, uh, Raymond James life well planned. So each of the, each of the ads had something like that and that kind of you know, three kind of thing construct. Um, I'm gonna show, uh, we didn't test this, so I'm hope, hoping the sound will come through. And uh, we made um, a number of digital and print ads like the one I showed you, we made three TV ads, which I'm gonna kind of highlight here. This is just an example of one. While you may not be a pediatric surgeon volunteering your topiary talents at a children's hospital, your life is just as unique. A Raymond James Financial Advisor gets to know you, your passions, and the way you give back. So you can live your life. That's Life Well Planned. I don't know how many, I, I did not know a lot about topiary art before uh, that campaign. Um, that was not a real topiary art. They, they constructed something kind of out of uh, fake greenery. Um, but um, the, 
Does anyone remember March 2020, uh, like what big event happened that month? Yeah, it's like, like that, you guys aren't, aren't that young, right? Like everyone remembers that's when the pandemic kicked off. That is within three or four days is when we launched this campaign. Um, so it took us a year to kind of get the big idea. We went over to Spain. We did a week of shooting, film, uh, lots of production work, ready to launch it. Um, and um, the, um, you know, beyond kind of uh, uh, an idea of living your life, just as the government's telling you to go into quarantine, the three TV ads that we selected each had uniquely terrible aspects of them for a pandemic. Um, you just saw this one, a doctor with children with no masks running around a hospital. Um, one of them was a, a woman who took her mom and her daughter on a clips chasing event uh, in Spain, uh, international travel at one of the ground zeros of COVID. Um, and then this one I didn't quite get at first. Um, this is an architect uh, who is mentoring uh, a teenager um, and has beekeeping as a, ho a hobby. Um, but we started getting complaints that it looked like our uh, clients had hazmat suits on. Um, so uh, all that work, we had a big, big media buy, multi-million dollar media buy. We had to pull it down within the week of, first week of doing it. Um, and so we started saying, you know, what are we going to do instead of this? We have all this inventory that we have to use. Are we just going to flush it down the toilet? You know, are, are no one really, obviously you guys all remember, uh, presumably you were in high school or maybe some of you in college at the time. You weren't sure, was it going to be over in a week? Would we all be back? Um, so after we had waited a couple of weeks, we said, we can't wait on this. Um, we were going to lose millions of dollars of ad inventory, and we decided to do kind of an ad hoc ad. Um, and given kind of the environment we were in, we knew we couldn't do anything that had a high-end production. We certainly weren't going to be traveling to Spain to do something like this. Um, and so we came up with an idea uh, to um, um, feature our, our mission statement. Um, which is, uh, is totally oriented around uh, our business as people. That's sort of the first line in the mission statement. Um, and we hired an artist um, uh, who's known for doing really simplistic line drawings, um, both kind of a print and digital, but also had done some short films and telling stories. Um, and what we came up with, uh, we, we learned kind of, we weren't really talking about our clients, but we, our stakeholders love this. Um, partly because the, the message was really, you know, familiar because it was our mission statement, um, but also because of how well it resonated during that. So if you could put your, your mind back to how you felt those first couple of months of the pandemic, um, and then imagine, you know, kind of seeing an ad like this. Since our beginning, our business has been people and their financial well-being. It's evident in good times with decisions focused on the long term and crucial when circumstances become difficult. That continued emphasis on people, our advisors, associates, clients, and communities gives us purpose, strength, and a way forward, today and always. So, th so that ad actually um, has become a kind of an asset in terms of our employee uh, communications because it conveys our, our values so well. And for me, it's always going to be kind of a great memory of uh, a botched uh, media plan, um, but being able to respond and recover in a way that uh, resonated and uh, didn't waste millions of dollars, which like, still makes my palms sweat uh, thinking about it. Um, so by the time we got to the winter, we decided we could kind of revisit the live your life. I mean, COVID obviously continued, it still continues, uh, but we felt comfortable with that. It really has tested well. We saw our, our brand awareness grow during that time. Um, and we've gotten to a place where um, we would typically, if it's a successful campaign, we'll extend it. So we'll take the same idea, the clients, uh, client scenarios, and reshoot. Um, but because of the success of that line drawing and the, the impact that, um, um, uh, that animation had, uh, as well as because it's also different, um, like you don't see a lot of ads that look like that, um, we decided we're going to try to tell the same stories only using animation. Um, and uh, we took kind of as inspiration, um, none, of, none of the students in the room will remember uh, United Airlines had a really successful animated ad campaign uh, 10 years ago um, that used Robert Redford and Gershwin music kind of as a voiceover that was very well done. Some of you may be familiar with The New Yorker. They have like an illustration style that kind of has an elevated, sophisticated feel. So we kind of took these as um, inspiration and um, have developed characters. Um, we engaged a, a production company in England 
uh, that has uh, award-winning uh, short films using animation. Um, they've done some ads for um, the Olympics and uh, Wimbledon as well. And we took basically the same you know, construct I described with the other one and are applying it here. Uh, so this is our, our client in this case. Um, this is the voiceover. So right now where we are is um, with, uh, unlike live action where you have a story and you go someplace for 10 days and you shoot an actor doing it, with animation, especially if you're doing hand drawing, it takes months. So it's very iterative. They draw sketches, they say, is this right? You know, then they kind of start doing it before they do any animation. Then they start you know, doing line drawings for animation. Uh, we're about two thirds of the way through the process. Um, so I'm just gonna show you some sketches and then I'm gonna show you one half baked uh, animation so you'll get an idea of where it's going. Um, but the voiceover for this ad, um, this is about a business owner whose um, father w owned a jazz club um, before he passed and it's now in a state of disrepair. And it, it will read or it will say, a business owner sells his company and takes on a passion project with his son, restoring his father's jazz club. Um, and then what they'll do, they'll be coming into this, the jazz club, they'll be looking around and as he turns on lights, he'll be remembering and we'll see it, what it looked like during its heyday, including seeing his father play the trumpet. Um, and then they'll be cleaning it up and they'll have some jazz music as it's kind of coming to an opening. And it'll say, from selling a business to giving back to where you came from, a Raymond James advisor gets to know you, your family, and the way you bring people together. Um, and then when he turns on the, um, uh, when the doors open to the public, we see the son and the father playing kind of in the same way that we saw the grandfather uh, in his memory um, uh, with the jazz club restored. Um, uh, the next one, this is, well, this is a pretty affluent kind of scenario, um, uh, but it's about a law partner, this woman, um, and uh, she's in her law office, which is portrayed there, um, and um, she pulls a book from the shelf, and when she opens it up, a, a crane uh, floats out, an origami crane floats out, and she's, then she'll be taken back in her memory to her grandmother, who was an immigrant, who also had a passion for origami art, um, and she's making that very crane. Um, and then in the process of making it, which you can see there, uh, she sort of sets it free. Um, and then it takes us through the dream of the client um, doing a passion project to dedicate a wing of a local museum to her grandmother's memory, uh, which would feature origami art. Um, and it says, a law partner rediscovers her grandmother's artistry and establishes a charitable trust to keep the craft alive for generations to come. A Raymond James gets, advisor gets to know you your passions and the way you enrich your community. Um, at the end of it, uh, the crane, which will kind of be taking us through her dream, dream sequence, will fall into her daughter's hand and she'll place it into a, a um, uh, part of the, um, the display, which will kind of also symbolize kind of the intergenerational passing down a heritage, but also uh, passing down um, uh, those memories. Um, and the final scene with, will, will be kind of the opening of the, um, of the museum. And then the last TV ad, we'll have other, others that will be digital and print. Um, and this is the one I'll show you a half-baked kind of animation uh, for, is a couple that's just retiring. Um, and uh, you'll see in the opening scene um, that they're, they're doing plans at, on their retirement to open a Greyhound sanctuary for rescue dogs. Um, not surprisingly, of all, we, we tested probably 15 different client scenarios. This one tested the best of all of them. Like it's always, uh, with dogs, you're, you can't go wrong with dogs. Um, and uh, the voiceover, which you'll hear in a minute, um, actually I won't read that since you'll hear it, uh, but it takes us through um, kind of their literally planning for it uh, through the construction process to the realization of the dream um, with the same role of the advisor. Two retiring business executives turn their post-career mission to great So um, I should have mentioned um, that we will not have British voiceovers, that, that the production company is in England, so they're just reading it. Um, so right now we're, we're going to have, an, a, a, we are gonna have a woman be the voiceover, but uh, she'll have an American accent. Um, there's a lot, there was a lot there, you didn't see our logo, that, this is still sort of a work in progress, but that gives you an idea of where we're going. So I'm gonna shift um, to kind of the last part of my update. Any questions on 
I'm happy to save it for the end too, but any questions on uh, the advertising? Okay. Um, so in my department, we don't spend very much time thinking about advertising. Um, that's super important. That represents probably half of my budget because of the, the cost to produce and place ads. Uh, but we have 200 associates um, on, on my team who um, on a day-to-day -day basis are much more focused on helping our firm grow its business, um, working with uh, our different business units on marketing, uh, communications. Um, and the way we describe kind of our, our reason for existing um, is that we are agents of growth, supporting a growth company, um, but we're also advocates for our brand. Um, and so we, we, certainly anyone in my department views themselves as a brand manager, um, but we try to make sure that we're kind of instilling kind of that, that best of both world in everything that we do. Um, the way we operationalize that, um, we have kind of five major areas, um, and this would also be kind of a transition a little bit for any of you that are, are kind of interested in corporate marketing. This is not an unusual structure. Um, the four dark boxes on the outside probably have roughly 20 people in each of them. Uh, the marketing insights and technology is um, uh, what I would call the backbone of our, our marketing decisions. These are uh, competitive intelligence, database marketing, marketing insights, um, you know, enabling our marketing managers with technology, um, competitive intelligence. Um, so they're, that's a more of a quantitative analytical uh, part of the, uh, of the team. Um, we have interns um, in that department every semester, um, and we usually hire two or three analysts each year. Um, corporate communications, um, that's public relations, uh, government communications, investor communications, internal communications. For a firm like Raymond James, where we have over 20,000 associates globally, our internal communications is actually more complicated than our public communications, which at a lot of bigger companies, you know, PR is kind of the big you know, organization. Probably 60% of our team is working on communicating to different uh, stakeholders and you know, using different complicated um, or different um, uh, communication channels to kind of navigate complicated uh, communication challenges. On the bottom, um, we have a 20-person meeting and events team, um, and they do um, they probably do 250, so probably five events every week, and some of those are like hosting you know 20 clients. Um, you know, in New York City for um, you know, a client event to having you know, 7,000 financial advisors and uh, support associates in Las Vegas. Um, they were recently in Greece with some of our top advisors on a rewards trip. And so uh, those are people that are you know, kind of trained to uh, do meeting events. It's a very intense group. And of course, all of this is integrated. And the last group is sort of a hodgepodge of things. We, we have uh, a corporate, I mean, a, a community impact group for our charitable giving. Um, we do some strategy work, client experience. Um, these, these associates tend to kind of be related to our insights. They tend to be more analytical, quantitative, um, but have a special focus. And then the middle, which is where most of our associates uh, reside, is our in-house agency. Um, when we started doing that, So that's our structure. Um, I was going to use this to kind of uh, you know, pivot to um, uh, you know, kind of what we look for. You know, given our agency model, we have a lot of early career associates. Um, I would say uh, probably 40% of our uh, team are uh, in their 20s, um, and we hire uh, probably um, 10 to 15 uh, people who are right out of college or within the first year out of college each year, um, and we see a lot of growth. Started our, our marketing department with 25 people, so we've grown kind of that way. 
Uh, but we also see a lot of associate um, take jobs in the Disney. Make. Um, today I know that Disney has an organization like that. I know Publix does as well. It's much more common. If, if you've had any exposure, some of you have had internships uh, at agencies, it, it's structured very similar to that. Writers, designers, interactive media, audio video, social media, and then the interface to our clients who are internal business units are account managers. Um, and we have roughly 50 account managers supporting all the different lines of businesses and our financial advisors. That's the most common way that uh, the students join us. And I, I always call that as you know, being kind of a starter CMO um, because you're working with, if you're working with one of our client, bank clients, you're their go-to guy for uh, any marketing. And so some days you're helping them coordinate with our meeting team. Some days you're running analysis to help do a strategic plan. Some days you're managing a project, you're working with the creative team. Uh, it's not dissimilar from what my day-to-day -day would be, you know, kind of on a different scale. Um, so that's our structure. Um, I was going to use this to kind of, uh, you know, pivot to, um, uh, you know, kind of what we look for. You know, given our agency model, we have a lot of early career associates. Um, I would say uh, probably 40% of our uh, team are uh, in their 20s, um, and we hire uh, probably... Um, 10 to 15 uh, people who are right out of college or within the first year out of college each year. Um, and we see a lot of growth, both in terms of our firm growing. Um, when I started, our, our marketing department was 25 people, so we've grown kind of that way. Um, but we also see a lot of associates um, take jobs in the businesses that they support. Um, and so we have a lot of kind of uh, natural room for people to grow up, and then we hire kind of at more uh, junior levels. Um, so I, what I thought I would do kind of with that is just pivot to the last you know, kind of thing I wanted to mention before opening up for questions. Um, you know, what do we look for for associates that are filling those roles that might be relevant? Hopefully, even if you're not interested in Raymond James Marketing, hopefully this would be relevant uh, for any of you that are you know, at some point in your, your job search. Um, uh, the first thing, um, which I'm sure you've gotten this from Career Services, um, is depressingly how little time prospective uh, employers will spend looking at your resume or your LinkedIn profile when you have an application or a communication. Um, we actually uh, have uh, full-time candidates who are graduating next year, and we have interns coming in for spring and summer, so I'm seeing a lot of resumes. I can tell you we spend a good bit more than seven seconds on resumes, but it is a, a real scan. Um, and uh, again, hopefully this is uh, either reinforcing or maybe even redundant for some of you. Um, but what I always encourage um, when we mentor our associates or even for our interns, uh, we ask them to have that in mind and say, make sure you're collecting during your, your college career that you're collecting proof, collecting proof points for what those managers are looking for or scanning for. Um, if you're looking for your first internship, that, that to me is the hardest uh, step because um, you know, an internship would love to see you have had a, a marketing internship, and it's always sort of the, you need a job to get a job. Uh, the great thing about, you know, student organizations is there's, there's a couple of big categories of things that I know many of you are taking advantage of. In fact, every one of you hopefully has one proof point that you're going to see here by being here tonight. Um, but the first would be kind of on the academic side. Um, of course, if you're majoring or minoring in marketing, communications, advertising, something uh, marketing analytics, something that kind of that's, you know, that de demonstrates an interest in marketing if you're looking for a marketing role. Uh, that's an easy start. I, I would tell you, um, I do not, we do not have a bias for people that major in those. Um, you know, some of our best hires, um, I have a, one of my most senior managers who we hired straight out of school uh, was a psychology major. Um, and I remember her resume still, she featured all the quantitative research, analytical things that would translate really well. Um, so it doesn't have to be that, but that can be one. Uh, obviously, getting good grades is great. If you have good grades and put that on there, that's something the employer's gonna notice. Um, but a couple other things that I, we see students do that are great is um, taking advantage of research projects. Even if it's not a marketing, uh, or maybe even if it's not a business uh, research project, um, there's uh, things that de or you can demonstrate to employers that are kind of competencies that will carry through. Um, and then finally, um, and I think probably most of you know this, but if you have a class that you know and would be particularly relevant to a, a discipline, if you're a psychology major, you mentioned two or three marketing classes on your marketing resume. Um, the, the, the types of classes we, we are particularly interested in are more 
quantitative analytical, marketing classes, marketing research, database marketing, um, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a second. The other category um, are, you know, kind of pre-internship uh, category is, uh, you know, clubs and activities. Um, obviously, if I would encourage, if everyone here is not part of the AMA, you, sh you know, I, I would recommend you join it. That's a proof point that we'll see, you know, American Marketing Association. Um, obviously, roles in clubs can be very important. So even if you're, if you're in a club that has nothing to do with marketing or business, but you can, you're managing their social media or you're head of their marketing or their communications, um, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be a leadership role. You know, that's a proof point. Um, you could do the same thing in, on the community service front, whether it's explicitly for uh, the community or you know, something that you're doing in support of a club that supports it. Um, and then one of my favorite ones, and I've given this advice to a lot of mentees over the years, um, you know, a lot of students have full-time jobs or are working in the you know, with, their, uh, with the school to help pay for their uh, tuition. Um, look for opportunities where you can contribute to the communications or the marketing or the promotion of what you're doing. You know, if you work in an ice cream shop, ask the owner if you can help them with their social media. And having that bullet point, you know, we all know if you're working in an ice cream shop, you know, what you're spending most of your time doing which as an employer, I think that's great. Like I wanna see people that have had you know, real life experience working with retail customers, you know, demonstrating the maturity that comes with that. Um, but if you kind of pull out that you help them with a campaign or help them with a product launch or something, um, you know, that, that's great. And you can do that if you have that kind of relationship with your boss. Um, obviously, once you've done that, you know, internships are great. Um, but I, we, every, every semester we hire people that have nothing but these kinds of things to show for um, their application for internships, um, and if you're thoughtful about how you package it, um, there's no reason you can't, you can't land those. And I know any of you that are seniors, many of you that are seniors or um, maybe even juniors already have done that. Um, and then what I would just say kind of as a rule of thumb, if you're going in for an internship, you know, try to have at least three kind of quality, ideally four uh, of these proof points for an application, especially, uh, particularly if you don't have an internship. And then for full-time roles, um, you know, I think five would be a minimum. Um, and if you're not kind of trending to that, I, I know if you're a senior right now, it's, it, you're kind of, uh, you know, kind of in the uh, job search mode already, but certainly for those of you that are earlier, it's not too late to kind of pick those up. Um, I, I tried to anonymize this, so I'm gonna look at it again. I, this is a resume I actually just got today, um, and I did the little scan and I highlighted, um, you know, um, the things that kind of stood out to me as sort of those proof points. This is for a full-time role. And you can see she, she got to the seven uh, threshold, uh, obviously a uh, several internships. With that, that's exceptional, getting three internships. Um, but she has the club, the four A's. Uh, she did uh, something with her um, uh, school around search engine optimization. And she has a uh, kind of a Google certification there as well. Obviously, some of these things mean more to us than others. The internships are really important. You know, grades are really important. Um, Hopefully that's kind of uh, all common sense for you guys. Um, and then the last two things I'll just mention um, is um, you know, most larger companies, and I think I'll, most employers now, uh, and I'm sure your career services uh, have, have you know, guy, ad, advised you on this, but I, I would tell you we're gonna have um, students coming in next month, and I would guess that half of them haven't been given this advice, at least from the way they interview. Um, you know, have three to five stories down that can address most of the behavioral interview questions you'll get. You know, tell me a time uh, that you had to, you know, deal with conflicting priorities. Um, tell me a time you had to deal with, a, you know, a team where you had a difficult team member. And, you know, it's obvious why firms are trying to get to that. Um, but you, you should, you, I think if you have three really good questions or stories, you can probably answer all of those. There's always a way to kind of weave that back in. Uh, have that down, find, you know, practice it. Don't have the first time you really kind of work that out, be your first interview, because you know, that might be the job you really want. Um, so just encourage you to really have those stories down. Like for me, um, I'm not, uh, maybe it's obvious I'm not a you know, great public speaker. Um, that's not natural to me. I have to, like when I used to do interviews, I would practice it with my wife or my, my girlfriend at the time and tell her to have it you know, so that I kind of had the experience of getting that out. If you're really good at it, that's great, um, that will really serve you well, but make sure you have the substance of that down. Uh, and then the last thing is you know, specific to marketers, um, and this is one I had, I think, in one of the questions. Um, uh, you know, the one answer, at least for me, and I've talked to some other CMOs, um, if someone says, well, why are you interested in marketing? 
uh, whatever you do, do not say um, it's because I, you know, I like to be creative uh, or that I hate math or something that kind of suggests that your view of marketing is, you know, is something around a design or a creative process explicitly. One of the reasons I love marketing, um, and I didn't study a single marketing class in college, I discovered it in my first job, um, is because it, is, it does allow a platform for expressive, uh, or for expressing kind of creative problem solving. Um, but uh, the most successful and kind of um, professionally managed marketing organizations have a very heavy focus on data-driven uh, insights, uh, competitive context, um, uh, consumer or client um, you know, insights or behaviors. Any, any creative exercise has to be grounded, from my perspective, in you know, an rigorous analysis, quantitative uh, uh, rigor, and um, for any of our marketing managers, of course, if you're, a, if you're a graphic designer or a writer, that's fine. That's a, that's a creative discipline, um, and that's fine for an answer. But for anyone that's interested in marketing management, um, you know, please be prepared. Um, and that, this does not apply to just for us um, to talk about, you know, if you want to kind of marry the creativity with the analysis, um, to me, that's why I love it so much. But don't, don't just leave it with creativity, because I've never ended an interview at that point, but in my mind, that's usually kind of the end of the assessment because I know there's not going to be a fit uh, for the candidate. So, um, all right, the last thing I'm going to do and um, uh, is just really high level, you know, some, uh, and, and we'll have time here with uh, uh, afterwards where we, if you guys want to come up, if anyone's specifically interested in marketing or Raymond James marketing or other uh, paths. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of opportunities we have. Um, and I'm sure a lot of other employers have similar things to this, kind of a pre-internship. Um, this could be one of a really great proof point, um, uh, you know, for, especially for students that may not know if they want to go into marketing. Um, we have a mentor program, and it's basically a monthly meeting with a, a senior leader. Um, I participated in every quarter, and we have uh, 10 other senior leaders on my team who mentor students. Um, and... Uh, we have a um, kind of an afternoon session where students, and it's all virtual, afternoon session where students will get exposed to other leaders. And you have the opportunity to attend our staff meetings and some of the other things we do that have virtual events. By the end of the semester, you'll have a really good sense of what it would be like to work at Raymond James Marketing. You'll have had a chance to network with senior leaders, but you'll also have had a chance uh, to network with near peers, you know, student, um, professionals who are like in their first two or three years out of college. We always pair up the students with them as well. It's a great way to kind of get a, a, a taste of, of a corporate marketing function. We do that spring, summer, and fall. Um, we also have uh, paid internships every semester. Um, we focus those on juniors and seniors. Um, we don't typically consider seniors in their last semester um, because at that point, you know, we, we want to look at these uh, candidates as potential full-time hires, and we make those decisions before their, uh, their last semester. Um, we've occasionally had sophomores, um, particularly if they've got a lot of proof points, but usually they're uh, more for this. And right now we're accepting applications for both the spring and the summer. Uh, and then I mentioned this, um, the full time. Uh, we have coordinators that go into those uh, marketing manager roles. We also have analysts that are more quantitative uh, minded. Um, and we have campus uh, programs um, through our HR program. Um, that we recruit for starting in January, the beginning of the summer, and the beginning of the fall, depending on when you graduate. Um, but we also hire a good number of students um, kind of on a demand base. So we've had some really great hires from students who maybe were studying abroad or just didn't kind of make it a focus. And then we have a, like right now, we have a marketing coordinator job. If someone was graduating next month, you know, they could apply for it as well without going through the kind of normal campus recruiting. And then um, I know these are probably not easy to read, but we have flyers up here that you can come by afterwards. If you're not necessarily interested in marketing, um, it's always easy for me to forget that Raymond James is not a marketing company. We're a financial services company. So we hire a lot of uh, finance type jobs and risk management jobs and other jobs and you know, the different business functions you'd find at any uh, Fortune 500 company. Um, we have some really uh, you know, great sophomore opportunities to kind of similarly like that mentor program for marketing uh, to kind of... Uh, uh, get some early exposure, um, and you know, at the end of the of the session, if anyone's interested in that, please come up, and um, we've got a representative from HR who can talk to you about that as well. So, I think, oh, 
Uh, very important. Um, if you want to register for that, for uh, Julia uh, to have us in our HR system, um, you know, uh, you can capture that QR code and uh, uh, we'll get your email and then you'd be on our, our list for when, uh, for different times. Um, Julia, did, did you want to mention kind of the, dead, the timelines that we have as well? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, we're, and then after she does this, we'll open it up for questions. She mentioned about the QR code. It's up there, but also if anybody's planning to come up to the table as well, there's also some little business cards with that QR code. And you may have also received some when you walked in um, to the membership or you checked in. And um, yeah, just everyone give a nice round of applause for Mike. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, you know, and we, we can't say for certain, but the way we're viewing kind of uh, incorporating technology and, and uh, you know, uh, AI, generative AI, uh, into the advice process is that it will enable the advisor. Um, we've kind of used a bad kind of metaphor of the bionic advisor, um, that a lot, of, uh, a lot of advice and decision making that advisors are making today based on their experience or their expertise um, may be kind of enhanced or maybe even replaced to some degree, kind of in the same way that maybe a doctor's diagnosis would be, um, but that um, we, we believe that the interest in having human advisors from a certain set of the, the population will persist. Um, because while, you know, kind of uh, having a, a, a portfolio that's well diversified, uh, managing risk, optimizing returns, you can get more and more technology in that. Um, a lot of... Um, Financial decisions are, emotion, are emotional decisions. Uh, they're making trade-offs, and there's not a right or wrong answer to it. And for some people, like I'm actually more like that, I'm very comfortable you know, for, the, for a computer to say, here's sort of the trade-offs, here's the things you should consider in doing that. Um, but a lot of people, with, especially with these big decisions, need to have, uh, want to have someone they trust um, who can kind of, and understands their value sets and understands their family situation or their business situation. And so that's our working assumption. I mean, it's going to be really interesting. I've been around long enough to know in the 90s, one of my jobs at Prudential was uh, developing a web-based platform that we thought was going to disintermediate the advisor. Um, and of course, that didn't happen. I mean, there are, there are certainly clients that use you know, online platforms exclusively. But and then on the marketing front, um, we're actively uh, exploring ways to use generative AI 
uh, for the creative process. Um, you know, we've, we've been talking to consultants and looking at different platforms. You guys have all used ChatGPT. That's a real obvious one for content. There's the same sort of applications for design. Uh, but we're also looking at it for um, insights in terms of, um, you know, uh, insights for campaigns, you know, being more segmented and more thoughtful and more predictive versus just looking at correlations saying, we believe there's a real predictive value to um, kind of the campaign results that we're finding. So um, we've, got a, we've got a kind of a team that's actively looking at that. I would expect, and, and we're using it in small ways uh, today around some of our uh, modeling for um, some of our target markets where we don't have complete information, but we're saying this client most likely looks like this to help our advisors. So we're at the very early stages of it. It's exciting, but, uh, but I don't think at this point we're feeling like it's existential to our core business. Another question I had for you, as far as critical thinking and analytics, I know a lot of students who major in marketing may have a little fear of mathematics, uh, but, but is analytics about mathematics or is it applied mathematics or what, what exactly is analytics and how do you use it? Yeah, that, that, I'm not going to have a good answer for that. That's a great question that uh, probably merits more thought than I can give on the fly. I, I would first tell you um, I hated math. Um, I, I was in my calculus as per professor's office probably cumulatively for that one class more than all the other classes I took in college. Um, to me, uh, you know, analysis is, is more about making connections and thinking things through in a, a kind of with rigor, um, applying learnings, um, looking at, um, you know, structuring questions. A lot of like we've been talking about like, you know, things like generative AI, it doesn't replace human intelligence. It, it puts a lot more onus on structuring a question um, if you've used that, you've, you've experienced this. If you don't ask the, you, you ask the question in different ways, you're going to get different answers. Um, and I, that's the way I view kind of the different components for marketing. If we're thinking about reaching, you know, the 15 million people that we want to have as our clients, what are the different ways we can approach them in the different marketing channels and the different communications and messages that it might apply to each of those? And it's about structuring it and then having a sense of what the data possibilities are. And then for someone like me, um, and, and maybe for many of you, knowing that you'll have partners um, kind of in a marketing insights team who can help translate that into requirements. Um, and and in a, increasingly, I, I, mean, I actually inter interface with a lot of relational databases now because the tools are so accessible. Um, like five years ago, you would have to get your hands into SQL or do some real programming. And today, um, I have things on, you know, on my desktop that I'm regularly kind of running different analyses. So um, I would just tell you, don't, don't shy away from marketing management if that's a potential concern, um, but definitely lean into the fact that you, you, you know, to have, you know, to be able to apply your creativity, you have to have kind of good structure behind it. Just having a nice 
pulse rate may, like I said, like keep screen the residues for about seven seconds, seven, ten seconds, in case you could screen the residues for good fit or not. So have a GPA in there, have ex it's usually it's not required to have in there, but it's good to have a GPA in there. Extracurricular activities, so several of these coursework is good as well. Um, any recent, you know, part time job experience, full time job experience, um, volunteer work, things like that on the resume. And I, just expanding on one thing Julia said that's really important as well. When, if you get an interview, um, if, you know, we see so many students that kind of like, and again, I, you know, you all have, don't have a lot of experience, um, but don't be shy about following up. You know, absolutely send a thank you note. Uh, reflect something that you heard from the per each person you spoke to. Reflect something that you heard from them in the interview. I would strongly encourage you to bring uh, a notebook. I, I'm like, still have the notebook I had from college. You're taking notes while you're talking to the candidates, and then follow up with them you know, a few weeks later. Um, sometimes the, the delay feels like a long time, but I know, you know for marketing, I don't look at this quite as much, but I know some of our organizations, they actually look at the student's follow through as sort of an indicator of potential success. Is this person who's someone who really wants it, are they gonna go get it? Um, and then on the front end, like Julia said, yeah, don't be shy about tapping your, uh, your network. We have a, a number of people who went to Tampa in my department, one of my favorite uh, campus recruits, uh, who was one of our senior managers and now is a financial advisor here, a very successful one in, in Tampa, uh, went here. Um, if I get a, an email from one of those guys, you're gonna get kind of additional consideration. I mean, and so please, yeah, that I would say, well, I, you know, obviously you have to have a resume, you have to do the application, but you know, do the other things Julia said as well, that's really important. questions. I did just want to make one more announcement. So you should have received a paper when you walked in. If not, we can hand that out to you as you leave. There should be two QR codes on there. One of them is going to be a post-event survey and one of them is going to be registration for our next event, which is next week with the co-founder of Next Level Brands and Hospitality. So definitely make sure you register for that before it gets sold out. Okay, everybody is welcome to get up now. Thank you.